Steve. We are recording. Okay, shall I go ahead? Take it away, guys. Introduce yourselves. Um, and, you know, we're happy to have everybody. We've got about 15 people here right now. Hi, I'm Steve Huss. Uh, I'm going to devote a little bit of time to the history of Lake Decatur. I'm Gary Geisler, and I'll be speaking as one of the participants tonight, too. Okay. Uh, I'll go ahead and start. Uh, when Gary asked me to participate in this presentation, I could not think of a more interesting subject. I have a lot of photos of the lake and probably put too many online tonight, so I'm going to try to make it fast and furious. Uh, I did grow up in Decatur. I spent a lot of time around the lake, and hopefully I've not left out anything significant uh, in telling this story. The history of Lake Decatur uh, is arguably, uh, go back just one slide, is arguably the greatest asset the city has providing water for industry and the population. And Decatur was founded in 1830 uh, and might not have been even ever uh, an entity had it not been for the Sangamon River. The river's origin is in Southeast McLean County and that one map right there, it starts in a small town a little bit east of Bloomington and it goes down through Muhammad and Monticello and then through Decatur. And it follows a circuitous route uh, for its 246 miles before it ends up in the Illinois River north of Beardstown. Contrary to popular opinion, it is not the source of Lake Springfield. That in the middle of that map is the watershed for Lake Springfield. I mean, correction for the Sangamon River and Lake Decatur. Uh, we were not blessed with a Muhammad aquifer such as Champaign and Urbana and, and Muhammad. And uh, therefore, we needed our source to come from the river. In the beginning, the city relied on hand dug wells. Some of them were very large, 10 feet by 40 feet. They had large pumps. Uh, they also did pull water out of the Sangamon River. Hieronymus Mueller was appointed the first city plumber in, in 1871 and was tasked with putting in water lines and pumps. Uh, moving on to uh, bridges uh, and forge and how we got across uh, the uh, Early bridges and beginning uh, the river level, there were crossing fords. There was Spangler Ford, which were the William Street bridges. There was Cal Ford, which was just downstream of the current Route 36 bridge. There was uh, one east of Weichel's Road. Flooding was always a problem. And so that led to bridge building. So if you'll just hold that picture right there, and we'll look at that. And that's a picture of the uh, Decatur to Vandalia Road, which is the current Route 51 route. That's the covered bridge. That's, that's the route that we now go over when we go on Route 51 by the dam. Uh, the um, covered bridge was built in 1840. It was raised eight more feet in 1913. They put lights on it then in 1921-22. It was raised another 15 feet. Uh, and, and that pathway is actually the south side of the Route 51 that we go on now. The north side was actually built in 1962. Uh, other bridges included the Spangler Bridge, which is the William Street Bridge, the Calford Bridge, uh, which later became the Nelson Bridge. And then uh, there was Lost Bridge. Uh, we all know about Lost Bridge. Uh, that image of Lost Bridge, I'll just focus on that. That was about 1960. It shows it under development. There were two contractors. The first contractor was fired and finally the bridge was completed, but down on the bottom of the picture shows the span as I knew it when I was a child, and it was a one-way bridge. Uh, your parents driving the car, they would have to stop and wait for the traffic coming from the other side to clear before they could go across it. And then fortunately, uh, they got rid of that span and made it uh, as it is today. Uh, the uh, other bridges here, the Maffet Bridge, it was a three truss bridge. Maffet Avenue, which is goes intersects with um, uh, Lakeshore Drive. It crosses that bridge and it goes over to uh, a carriage route at that time, all the way over to Mount Zion. And then uh, go ahead and move the next uh, image. This is a man, Mr. Barnes, sitting on top of the Maffet Bridge uh, in March of 22 when the river was very flooded. Uh, the lake dam had uh, was near completion and he was getting some final shots from a bridge that was soon to disappear. Next image, and, uh, and the next one. 
That's uh, a threshing machine, a steam thresher that went off the side or through the Maffet Bridge about 1913, killing the driver. Uh, and this is an image uh, that shows, uh, it's, a, it's a current map of, of the lake. And uh, I don't know how well that can be seen, but uh, the Staley Bridge is at the top. There's a black trapezoid I put in, and that would have been the Staley Dam in 1922. Just below it in black is the Calford Bridge, and then halfway down the map is the Lost Bridge, and then the Maffet Bridge is on the left. Okay, next. This is uh, uh, one I really liked, and I, I superimposed uh, the Sangamon yeah. River in its circuitous route before it was dammed up and it's in red, the Sangamon River and all the oxbows and bends in the river. And then of interest in this map, this was a fishing map published in 1953 Herald and Review and it was also a brochure. So if you were a fisherman, you could look at this and it would say, you wanna catch crappie, go to that shaded area up there and so forth. But on the very left hand in red, you see a sharp angle there. And that is uh, Allen Bend. So Allen Bend Drive. And that's a big bend in the river that went, uh, as the river went from the South Moreland side all the way over to the, uh, it would be South Shores Drive area now, the Allen Bend Drive area. <clears throat> Go on to commercial ventures then. Uh, wait, before you do that, these are some of the other bridges. That's, that's the, that's the uh, Spangler Bridge, which became the William Street Bridge. And the next one, and there's Ray's Bridge, and uh, Ray's Bridge was preserved, as you know, it was raised. When the dam uh, flooded out that area, they just raised the bridge. Go ahead, the next one. Okay, on commercial ventures in both the river and later on in the lake, there were these things, such as ice harvesting, boating, swimming, and airmail. Next image. Uh, here is uh, Here are men uh, with large tooth saws uh, cutting ice, and the ice block cutting employed hundreds of men annually, hoping there was going to be a good winter to allow this because not all winters made this possible, but that's how we got ice. And ice was stored in ice houses. These blocks were floated on water to wagons and stored in large ice houses and the insulation used was sawdust and straw. Mr. Moffitt of DA Moffitt uh, started his business in 1863. He owned six of these ice houses. They filled railroad refrigerator cars. These cars were re-iced here in Decatur. This business kind of went to a collapse in 1907 when uh, commercial ice making machinery uh, was developed, refrigeration equipment. But Mr. Moffitt uh, just bought this equipment and continued on with his business, continuing to make ice in a new way. Uh, next image. Uh, there was boating when, when this was just a river, not yet a lake, next. And then there was the Riverside Amusement Park between the Maffet Bridge and the Route 51 Bridge. Uh, there's a boat slide, there was boating, there was picnicking, and there was swimming. Next. There were beaches. Uh, I saw reference to uh, Nelson Park Beach, also to a beach called Fletcher Beach. Uh, Nelson Park Beach is well known to most of us here. That's the 1960 uh, image of the beach house. Next. And uh, here's a 1939 aerial view of uh, Nelson Park Beach with a lot of sand. Nelson Park is behind it with a lot of young trees. And then there's a lifeguard uh, tower to the far right of this image. And uh, it looks like a wonderful place. The lake was uh, relatively low at this uh, point in time in 1939. It was probably at the peak of the summer it was hot and the water was down. Next. Uh, another, uh, next image please. And another uh, commercial venture that was tried, an original idea was to start commercial flights from Decatur to Chicago by seaplane and also to haul airmail. Sounded like a reasonably good idea. Uh, if you look in the upper left of this picture, there's the county bridge. So if anybody knows where Fisherman's Wharf is uh, down in the South Shores area, it's a lane that goes down behind the Decatur Memorial Hospital lab down there and what used to be Soy Capital Bank facility. Uh, it's first mid now, I think, or maybe it's not any, I don't think it's that now either. But anyway, uh, they had a dock there. They have a small dock and a commercial plane first landed in 1937. 
1940, this dock, this small dock was dedicated in the hopes that this venture would take off, but it did not. Uh, the, uh, uh, the US Postal Service was not very cooperative. There are also certain issues as far as commercial flights as you can only do this when there's water, when it's ice, you couldn't do it. The original uh, idea failed and in 1948, the city council banned all landings on the lake. Do the next picture and that'll show a, a plane coming in on dedication day in 1940. Okay, next. Um, happy people and their very nice wooden boat. Next. Uh, beautiful Chris Craft on a truck. Uh, looks like that's right down at the Nelson Park Beach area, Nelson Park Marina area. Okay. Now, next. Uh, and by uh, 1914, pressure was mounting, uh, and you can just hold it on that one for a little bit, uh, to uh, the water supply was a serious problem. And a water impoundment uh, needed to be built. Staley Company was urging this to be done too. And by 1919, there were two proposed sites for a new dam. The Staley Company uh, needed a dam desperately to impound water for its new corn sugar plant. In 1919, the state granted Staley the right to pump water directly from the river. This was the only thing which prevented the Staley Company from moving to Peoria which was where it had already invested $200,000 uh, for a plant site. Uh, they got free water for a good number of years. And in 1953, the free water issue became a point of contention with the city of Decatur as plans were being made to raise the dam, dam to a higher level and how to finance it. And Staley offered to give $250,000 toward the project, but uh, was unwilling uh, to uh, uh, pay for its water. A uh, few more images there. Uh, this is the first dam. It was made out of wood. You can see the smokestacks of the Decatur, Decatur Waterworks. You can see in the, in the top the railroad tracks, which were the Illinois Central tracks at that time. So just downstream on the river is this wooden dam that raised the level of Lake Decatur to 595 feet. Mind you that the current level of Lake Decatur is about 614.2 feet. So it's about nine and a half feet. Uh, I'm correction, it's almost 20 feet higher uh, now than it was uh, at this time. Next. And there's another view of the uh, wooden dam. There's a smokestack on the left, and then there's the railroad tracks in the center uh, background. Okay. Um, this 1878 dam was converted to a concrete dam from wood in 1910. And in 1916, it was raised 30 more inches. And uh, in 1916, uh, almost from uh, Westerns that we've seen on TV and range wars and so forth, uh, a great a concern was noted uh, when uh, a crew from Decatur went up to Oakley Township on the river to investigate a report that Mr. J.K. Peck had built a dam. He said he was trying to straighten the river and in doing so, he plugged up the river with a lot of timber. It appeared that he might have done that on purpose. Uh, this threatened Decatur's water supply and nearly closed the Staley starch plant. That was 1916. He was just testing the water, so to speak. A party of men went up from Decatur and dynamited his dam on October 11th, which restored the level of the lake and removed the threat. It took a few days for the water level to come back up, but no further uh, uh, attempts were made to do that kind of thing again. In 1918, the, the uh, concrete dam broke on the south end and another name that might be familiar was to some Decaturites came forth and his name was Mr. Bill Bosher or Bowsher. Uh, Bowsher Lane is down there at the end of South Fairview Avenue where the gravel pit is. He actually owned the uh, Decatur sand gravel and hydraulic uh, uh, pit down there which, uh, to, which we now call uh, the original pit down there we now call uh, Lake Tokorizawa. Uh, and he, he came forth in 1918 when the dam broke and brought men and trucks and sand and gravel and they bagged it and they saved the water supply even though the lake had gone down quite a bit. Well, this, uh, this was another uh, shot across the bow that uh, we were uh, in desperate problems as far as a water supply. Uh, the next uh, images refer to the uh, Staley Dam. 
and uh, go ahead and uh, show that one. Okay, now I, I superimposed the Sangamon River over an aerial photo that I took. And uh, uh, the uh, river uh, is, uh, went under the current bridge, uh, Route 36 bridge known as the Staley Bridge. And that in black, that little line there represents the original Staley Dam from 1920 to 1922. So that held back water and provided water for Staley and for Decatur. Uh, next image. And this is the Staley Dam. And uh, in the very back on the right, you can see about a half of the Cowper Bridge, later called the Nelson Bridge. So the, uh, the CINW railroad embankment, which in later years was the B&O tracks and the Chessie system and so forth, this embankment served as two of the wings of the dam. It would extend 250 feet below the railroad bridge. Uh, in other words, 250 feet further down from the railroad bridge was the spillway of the Staley Dam. Its dimensions were 390 feet on one side, 275 feet on the other, and the spillway was 350 feet long. It had a double row of sheet piling with 10 feet between the sheet piling and the space filled with clay and timber, and it had a four-foot opening in the middle, which they could put wooden slats in. Uh, next image there. And uh, this dam helped uh, Staley's immensely, of course, but it also helped during the construction of the new city dam. Uh, next image. And I like this picture a lot because it shows the Staley Dam and in the background above the railroad tracks, you can see the Staley Pump House. Uh, the Staley Pump House is building, being built at the same time that the Staley Dam was being built. Next image. Here's the Staley Pump House uh, and its full foundation. Water would then uh, backfill and fill up and, and be end up just below the bottom windows. The Staley Pump House was built and paid for by Staley Company. No city funds were used to, to build it. It was 62 feet tall. Uh, no red tape was involved. There were six centrifugal electric pumps. Uh, they used electrical pumps, which were smaller. They didn't use steam pumps at that time, which were huge. The combined horsepower of these six pumps was 700 horsepower. At that time, Staley was the largest consumer of water in the city. Next image. Uh, here's the railroad tracks going past the pump house. Next image. And here's a gentleman with a bag. And I zoomed into that. It looks like he's got a camera on his right hand. He's on a boardwalk, which was uh, he's walking towards the west. Pump house behind him and railroad tracks on the right. Next. Uh, another view of the Staley Dam with water flowing. Next, um, you can go on. We've already seen that one. Uh, go ahead. And uh, you can uh, go to the next image. Um, yeah, it's interesting. You look at that for a minute. In 1919, the two sites for the new dam were resolved based on the cost and geology. There actually was an alternate site for the dam. The more popular site, was 150 feet downstream of the county bridge. That's where it is now, 150 feet from the bridge we drive our cars over now. Next picture. Uh, this is the alternate site. That's the Wabash Bridge, the uh, Staley Bridge, uh, Woodrow Wilson Junior High School just to the right there, uh, South Fairview Avenue going down underneath that bridge. We've all been, the, the river goes underneath it. Uh, and uh, just on the right-hand side of this picture would, was where a dam was proposed to have been built. Uh, just imagine uh, Lincoln Park Drive being on the edge of Lake Decatur. Uh, that did not pan out, and the cost difference was estimated to be $456,000 if the dam were built at the 610-foot level. That $456,000 in 1919 equated to seven million two hundred thirty thousand dollars in today's dollars. Uh, a long dike also would have had to been built on the Lincoln Park side and there was concern that water would erode underneath this earthen uh, dike. And also at that time, we were uh, actually dumping uh, raw sewage uh, from Decatur into the Sangamon River below the original dam. We would have had to uh, extend our interceptor sewer from the uh, original dam all the way down to below this new dam where it here. Uh, but at the same time, fortunately, the uh, dipper lane 
sewage disposal plant was being built. So we had uh, modernization ideas and, uh, and plans for good uh, sewage management. And the dam cost uh, about $2 million, a little over $2 million in 1922. Uh, the sewage disposal plant about a million dollars uh, plus. And uh, then uh, construction costs, including uh, the cost of the construction, the cost of the purchase of the land, the cost of timber removal, and the removal of two bridges and the raising of three bid bridges. These images uh, show coffer dams uh, being built that had been built to allow the allow them to dry out the area, uh, so they could uh, build this. Go ahead, and you get a little bit closer views. Uh, this is the dam, that ridge in the center, uh, and next uh, picture, and this is the uh, Route 51 bridge at that time. Go ahead, next picture. Uh, now on this image. Uh, there, these are huge beams, and these men are in a dry area that later is going to be completely covered with concrete. Uh, these beams were driven down with pile drivers. Also, sheet piling, which was steel, was driven down too. It's driven down 20 to 30 feet deep until it hit hard pan. And then that was going to stick up, and then concrete would be poured down over that, and that would be effectively uh, rebar for anchoring uh, the concrete. Next. And uh, just additional images showing a drag bucket going by cable from one side to the other to carry materials. Next. And here is uh, one of the coffer dams surrounding the dam wing construction with beams sticking up out of the ground. Next. These images are all about 1921. Next. And uh, here's a, they had a small railroad line there. They had two derricks. I'm not sure if they were steam derricks or not. Uh, but the, uh, those railroad tracks were to convey materials. Next. And uh, just additional images of the construction with a lot of cribbing for the coffer dams that were being built uh, to dry out the area. And as I said earlier, having that Staley Dam uh, further upstream did help to control the flow of water. Uh, that is the uh, county bridge, uh, the Route 51 bridge uh, on the left with the um, footings in, in the uh, river slash lake. And then uh, there's the dam being built there. And next, uh, this is the spillway uh, with forms for the pouring of the concrete. Next. And uh, there's a derrick, a large derrick. There were two of those. They could swing, they could move, they could be moved into different positions. Next. Uh, I'll go back to that picture. Um, this is all concrete on the flooring of it. Not only do they have a spillway, but when the water comes over, they don't want it to blast and erode out all the um, sand and gravel uh, below it. So this is all uh, concrete, poured concrete for a long apron. Uh, next. And uh, this is just another device to move material and to dump it in a hopper. And then the hopper goes down or up that track there. Next. They also had a locomotive that pulled some of the uh, cars. Next. And uh, this, uh, these are, uh, when you look at the dam, you can see these. These are the floodgates. And uh, there's a mechanism there with large wheels for adjustments and the raising and lowering. I was looking at the dam today and water is freely flowing over the long spillway, but it's not coming out of the floodgates because the waters from the recent rains the past few days still haven't been what we'd call flood stage, I guess. So next, next. Uh, this is an early 50s uh, view, which shows the two lane county bridge, Route 51 bridge. Uh, if you are driving your car now and going south, over the bridge. You know it's two lanes on the left, two lanes on the right, or southbound. The southbound part is actually uh, the original lane. And if you look down underneath it, uh, take a quick look while you're driving your car uh, on the north span, you can see the original footings underneath that. Uh, and next. <clears throat> and there's the, the dam uh, at a point where it was not completely full. Next. And there's the uh, more modern aerial, next. 
And uh, that was uh, banners and flags and so forth uh, on the county bridge. I believe that was probably celebration day in 1923, dedication of the lake next. Um, and then a few more shots. Um, one interesting thing was that an Oklahoma company was contracted to remove the timber and they employed 100 men and they removed timber from 608 acres and that wasn't even nearly all the timber they had to remove but that was from the land that they could act that they actually owned at the time. And this uh, Dan Hardy would be very familiar with he knows the book it's the uh, planning commission's book 1920 looking at uh, what Decatur ought to do to modernize itself and prepare for the future. So this was a concept drawing in 1920. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, there's one bridge that never was built, and that was a bridge across Big Creek. Next. <clears throat> Just a few uh, aerial pictures I've taken. Uh, winter picture, next. Uh, and again, another winter picture. St. Mary's is in the exact center of this photo and uh, downtown Decatur is at the top center. Next. Uh, and then Lost Bridge and Staley Bridge in the foreground, a fall shot, not this fall, one of the, some other year. Uh, next. And Lost Bridge taken from the St. Mary's side. I was probably over St. Mary's when I took this picture. Big Creek is in the top center. Next. And uh, again, Lost Bridge in the bottom and uh, Staley and William and Ray's Bridge, next. And uh, next. And uh, the, uh, I'm gonna say just a couple more things. And uh, was there a picture of uh, Melissa of a man sitting on a dam? Uh, yeah, I have that at the end. Just, just go ahead and do that. And uh, that, that's, uh, it'll be fitting. Uh, the new lake in its inception was to cover all the lowlands from bluff to bluff and to be six to eight miles long. Well, it's longer than that, but it certainly did cover from bluff to bluff. Uh, in 1923, there was an offer made of $5, it was made to the public to name the lake. And uh, many people, uh, as it was quoted in the Herald Review, many tried but failed. So guess what? The generic name prevailed as Lake Decatur. And that picture of that man right there was a good friend of mine. He, uh, his name was Sam Suka, and he worked as an ortho tech at uh, Decatur Memorial Hospital. And I was in 2012, I was driving down Lincoln Park Drive, and there he was fishing. And he was on the original dam sitting there. And that was a dam many of you might remember. It had a great big iron wheel in the middle to raise and lower the gate. But uh, uh, And Sam just died, uh, I found out, just about two weeks ago. He was 88 years old. So... That's all I have to say. Okay, I'm going to talk about the first 50 years of Lake Decatur. And first of all, I'd like to show you, this is an actual edition of the Decatur uh, newspaper from 1921. And there was an entire section of the newspaper talking about Lake Decatur as it was being built and, and how important it was going to be for the city of Decatur. So the first 50 years of the existence of Lake Decatur takes us into the 70s, and that brings us to the recollection uh, of many of us. So let me talk a little bit about those 50 years from the 20s all the way to the 70s. The 20s was marked by celebration of the lake. Lake Decatur was hailed as an outstanding recreational place. Swimming, boating, and fishing were all considered to be outstanding. July the 4th, uh, of, I believe it was uh, 2023, uh, was marked as the Lake Celebration. And it was marked by a handful of nationally known outstanding swimmers, including Johnny Weissmuller, uh, an Olympic champion who later played Tarzan in the movies. And uh, uh, so he was not the only uh, Olympic swimmer and, uh, and there were a number of, of swimming races held that day. I think, Steve, you said that, that he won a number of those races. Isn't that correct? Yeah, he won the uh, 50, the 100, the 220, and the 500, and set a world record in the 500. Yeah, so it was, uh, it was quite a celebration held then. If we go all the way to the 60s and 70s, there was the Lake Decatur swim with a half mile and a quarter mile event. Dr. Bird was sometimes the chairman of the event, and Jesse Snoke and Jim Cave were also involved in the organization of it. 
uh, John Knoll, an All-American swimmer and, and later an attorney uh, from Springfield, competed and he won the event twice. Uh, you'll see him uh, referred to there uh, in, among the 27 who entered the Lake Decatur swim. Uh, interestingly, you'll notice among the uh, 14 to 15 year old age group, there's Debbie Bird. You'll notice among the 16 and 17 year old age group, there's Dennis Wax. And among the 18 and over group, there's Jim Rupp. So uh, some familiar names to a lot of us. Lake Decatur was also considered to be uh, a fisherman's paradise as early as 1923. Uh, you see Lori Kruger in that last picture, and uh, uh, she's one of the tops, was one of the top skiers in the country. Uh, her family were, were, were known as skiers. They were not the only skiers. In the Lake Decatur has been known as, as quite a, a place for skiers as well. Uh, moving on to fishing, Lake Decatur was considered a fishing paradise as early as 1923. <clears throat> the city and the state expended thousands of dollars to stock Lake Decatur. And at first they used railroad cars to dump fish into the lake. At one point, they dumped as many as 40,000 fish into Lake Decatur in, one, in, in uh, a single day, 40,000 catfish in a single day. The stocking continued uh, through the 20s. Sometimes they dropped as many as 5,000 fish into the lake uh, in one particular day in 1927. So Lake Decatur in the 20s and the 30s was really known as quite a place to fish. Boating has always been a very large part of the lake. In the 20s, there were canoe and rowing competitions. There's also been some, what I guess you would refer to as touring boats. You see uh, the Illinois, the largest boat on Lake Decatur. They charge 25 cents for uh, an hour's ride on the lake. If you were a child 10 years and under, it was only a dime. And that, uh, that uh, the Illinois boat uh, was, docked at the pier uh, in Nelson Park. So uh, that was something that was used quite often and, and, and well known because there's a lot of people that didn't have boats and they wanted to be able to see the lake and that was a way for them to see the lake. There was motor boats and there were speedboat races long before the power boat uh, racing that we recall from the 80s and 90s. Uh, as I say, the ski boating, I'm sorry, the skiing, has uh, been a big deal. In 1948, Lake Decatur was the scene of an attempt for a world ski record. And there was an airplane, a seaplane, that pulled five water skiers behind it. I think we may have a picture of that. Uh, and uh, they got up to 70 miles an hour on the water, but they couldn't get any faster as a result of the uh, water being choppy that day. So. Uh, they were not able to set a world record, but uh, nonetheless, you had five water skiers on Lake Decatur pulled behind uh, a seaplane. Uh, sailing has been big on the lake. The Conador Yacht Club has existed since the 30s. Uh, their sailors have been on the lake year after year. Uh, the Decatur Yacht Club's Invitational Regatta was an annual event in June of each year. Uh, the roles of the Yacht Club include many names that are well known to many of us, including Bob Buckles, Harry Hazelrig, uh, Bob and Gail Olson. More recently, uh, Greg Ferguson. Greg may be online to, uh, with us tonight. And Greg has uh, uh, participated with the Yacht Club and, and helped a lot of people learn how to sail. In the late 40s, Dr. Bird brought, brought his new 23-foot Chris Craft cabin cruiser to the lake. There was a newspaper article. There you see it about it. It was such a big event. It was, a, it was a big, beautiful boat with a wooden hull. In fact, uh, uh, these uh, uh, wooden hull boats, they looked and they performed very well. Uh, as I understand from Randy Wax, there was actually a Chris Craft dealer here on Lake Decatur. And, and uh, later when we talk about the uh, uh, Lake Patrol, Randy may refer to that. Beginning in the 50s, the issue of water supply became front and center indicator. It had been something, a, a subject that had been talked about before, but beginning in the 50s, it became uh, an even bigger subject. There was much consideration, as some of you may recall, about the Oakley Dam and Reservoir. It was later called Lake Springer. 
it would have been upstream. It would have been very favorable for, uh, for Decatur. It would have been a second source of water for Decatur. But the problems was that it was going to flood much of Allerton Park. And so you had uh, some uh, uh, conflicting interests going on there. The project died in the mid 70s. Uh, there was actually uh, some uh, consideration, uh, brief consideration, I suppose, to a pipeline from Lake Shelbyville to Decatur. Uh, that, that didn't uh, come to be uh, either. Uh, there was a, a plan then to control the water level of the lake that was adopted in the early 50s, uh, considerable price tag, but uh, uh, it, it provided us some additional water. Ultimately, it became necessary to raise the dam gates uh, so that the level of the lake could be raised. And of course, eventually there was the dredging project. We're gonna hear from uh, uh, Keith Alexander and, and I think Keith will tell us uh, a, a good deal about the, the dredging project. So with that, why don't we, uh, uh, we've got a video of the interview of Keith Alexander. I'm with uh, Keith Alexander. Uh, today and he is uh, water pro production manager here at the City Waterworks. I'll, at least I'll call it the City Waterworks. Um, Keith, how long have you been doing this? Uh, it feels like forever, Steve, but it's been it'll be 32 years next month I've been working for the city in various water capacities. And uh, could you give us an idea of what actually is done in this large facility, which really is at uh, Lakeshore Drive and Martin Luther King Drive. It's the big round building you see with uh, birds and fish on it. There you go, there you go. So what do you do here? Well, here we take Lake Decatur water and we purify it into drinking water. And that requires uh, several both chemical and physical steps that we take to treat the lake water. We pump it in from the lake. We uh, throw a bunch of chemicals at it initially to drop out the solids. And then we run it through some uh, filtering mechanisms to take out the finer particles. And uh, then we also treat it with chlorine and chlorine dioxide to kill any of the pathogens and, and other bugs that might be in the lake water before we ship it out to our customers. Where does the water come in from? Do you have one big pipe that goes in the lake somewhere, or do you have multiple? We do. We have one large pipe. It's, uh, it's, it's actually in the lake, just upstream of the dam. It's a concrete square that seems to rise up out of the out of the lake bottom and we have uh, six intakes uh, on that structure that the water goes into into a pipe and then it goes to the raw water pump station which is the brown brick building on uh, lincoln park drive just downstream of the dam and that pumps the water all the way up here to this building good very interesting um, tell us a, a bit about the size of lake decatur and uh, other facts about it and uh, touch a bit on uh, where the water comes from besides the Sangamon River or if that's the only source. Go ahead. Be glad to, be glad to. So so Lake Decatur is uh, is an interesting name because actually it's an impoundment or a or a dammed structure because okay. we built the dam in the, between 1920 and 1922. Um, so it could be called Decatur Reservoir or Decatur Impoundment, but those aren't as sexy as Lake Decatur, right. so they named it Lake Decatur. Um, so the lake is about 3,000 surface acres in size. Uh, it holds about 9 billion gallons of water currently since the latest dredging project that we wrapped up. Uh, but it's a relatively small lake for a watershed or drainage area of our size. We the watershed or drainage area of the lake is 926 square miles, takes up parts of seven counties in east central Illinois. The watershed goes all the way up into Ford County, Gibson City area, and it goes even into McLean County uh, east of uh, Bloomington Normal. So it goes quite a ways away from, from here. Most people think of Lake Decatur as being a local lake, but really the water comes from seven counties in Illinois. Uh, the Sangamon River is the main source of that drainage area, but some of the other major tributaries locally are Sand Creek and Big Creek, Finley Creek, uh, and then farther upstream there's many other streams that flow into the into the river which then flow into the lake. Okay. 
does the uh, you have some numbers uh, of uh, consumption by the city in Mount Zion of drinking water and water for industry and so forth per day? I, I, I do have some breakouts. One, one that would be of interest to most people is how much water a day comes out of the lake. And on an average day, the city here at this facility takes about 18 and a half million gallons of water each and every day out of the lake to use as drinking water supply for the city of Decatur and the village of Mount Zion. And the Archer Daniels Midland Company, which owns the North Water Treatment Plant, they bought it from the city about 20 years ago. Uh, they take out another approximately 15 and a half million gallons of water a day for their process operations. So 34 million come out of the lake every day. Uh, and then out of the 18 and a half here, about 60% of it goes to our two largest customers, which are Tate Lyle and ADM. They use the most potable water, drinking water in the city. Uh, Mount Zion is our third largest customer. And then um, Fugiao Glass is also in our top five. And then, uh, then after that, it becomes folks like the hospitals, Milliken University. Um, we have a few very large mobile home parks here in town that use a lot of water. Pharmaceutical industry uses a fair amount of water. Caterpillar, uh, firms like that. So that, that, that breaks out basically our top 10 or 15. Just curious how much uh, loss there could be in July from evaporation. Well, we know from the drought of 2012, during the hot summer day, with a lot of sun hitting the lake, that we were losing up to a quarter inch a day just in evaporation, which is several million gallons of water. Okay. Hard to believe, just in one day. It is. What are some of the emergency sources of water if we get into uh, an impending drought? How do you deal with a drought? How do you stop us from using water and where do you get extra water from if you have to? That's a good question. We've been working on that solution for many years. Uh, so the city has a low lake level drought action plan and it, it takes certain steps depending on how low the lake gets at certain times of the year because a low lake level in March is not as much of a concern for us as a low lake level in, let's say, August, because if it's in March, we're going to expect spring rain. So the lake's been around for literally 99 years this year, and uh, the, uh, we've always been able to fill the lake 100% by um, May 1st of each year. In other words, we get enough spring rain each and every year to fill the lake. The challenge is how long can we keep it full or relatively full until the next May 1st? So that's kind of built in or baked into our plan that I just mentioned. So what we do is we have several supplemental or additional water supplies that we can use if the lake gets, gets too low for our comfort levels. Uh, we own a, a former sand and gravel pit uh, just off of, uh, of South Monroe, north of Southside Drive. This is near Lugari's uh, auto repair, truck repair. Uh, we've owned that for several years, and we have a floating pump there that we can pump water directly from it into the south water treatment plant. So that's our that's our smallest and cheapest and most economical additional supply to use. The second one that we have is the DeWitt, uh, what we call the DeWitt County Well Field. So uh, after the drought of 1988, the city went up and purchased 120 acres of farm ground in DeWitt County over the Muhammad Aquifer. We have eight wells there that we can use that pump water into Friends Creek. That then flows into the Sangamon River, which then flows into Lake Decatur. And we can uh, produce upwards of uh, 10 million gallons of water a day out of that if all eight wells are pumping at full capacity, which we typically don't do because it drains that area really quickly. So in reality, we're in the neighborhood of six to eight million gallons of water a day out of that system. You also, uh, 1988, I believe, laid pipe down along Lincoln Park Drive from Lake Tokorozawa. Is that still an option? Is that That's not owned by the city, though, is it? That's correct. So in 1988, we did uh, get permission from the private landowners to use that water. Uh, it's still in private ownership, and we have since taken away that temporary pumping and piping structure. So that is in our plans to use that water if a drought became very serious and, and the other two sources I mentioned were not able to supply the amount of water that we need. We've also, in the last couple of years, we had a, a supplemental water supply study done 
and there's also the possibility of getting water further downstream of the sanitary district of Decatur. There's a fair amount of water in the Sangamon River downstream of the sanitary district facility. That water, uh, depending on how much money you want to throw at it for treatment, would be available here at, at this plant, but it's very expensive water. So those are the options that, uh, that we have on our, on our plan uh, at various stages, depending on how severe a drought we have. And just another quick comment, that plan looked at the worst case scenario drought that we have ever had on record. So we looked at literally the driest 12 months that have ever been recorded in the history of weather data in Macon County. And that's what we built our worst case drought into. So we've never experienced the worst drought, although we've had some very severe droughts in the 30s, the 1930s. We had some very, a very severe drought in 1988 a very severe drought in 2012. So we've been able to learn from each of those how our customers react to water conservation, how fast the lake is going to drop, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that's, and then of course you'd impose some water restrictions if you had to. Uh, would that amount to quite a bit? Uh, like don't sprinkle your lawns, don't wash your cars. Do you have a long laundry list of because that's a very sensitive topic when you talk about closing down car wash businesses, uh, et cetera. Exactly, and, and luckily our last experience was, was in 2012. We haven't had to do that in a while. But we did learn quite a bit, got a lot of feedback from folks like the car wash industries in particular, and also those that uh, manage athletic fields. Um, because typically a drought hits late summer, well that's when athletic fields need water because you got fall sports season. So not only was Millican calling us and letting us know their challenges, but so are the public high schools and the private high schools. So it can become a real challenge. That again is all part of the plan that I mentioned earlier. Um, so we do require those voluntary water restrictions, like reduce your lawn watering if you can, to full blown out mandatory restrictions like commercial car washes cannot operate unless they use water from outside of the city of Decatur, uh, which some of them did. They literally imported water and stayed open in 2012. Um, but again, we've learned a lot through the, between the drought of 88, the drought of 2012, and unfortunately because a lot of the other parts of the country have had severe droughts over the last, let's say, 15 years, we've learned a lot from what other big utilities have done, like, like, like Atlanta, Georgia, for example, and large cities in Texas and Arizona uh, and California. We've learned a lot about how they are managing droughts that are even much more severe than the ones that we've had to deal with. Okay. Uh, the uh, I'll ask you in a moment about the, the dredging project, but uh, subsequent to the dredging project and, and being a homeowner on the lake, I really have noticed an improvement in the clarity of the water. Uh, if you look at your hand, how many feet below the water can you see your hand compared to the way it used to be? But how do you address those who, and I don't hear it much anymore, but people forever were always, always saying that Lake Decatur is polluted. I think they're putting it in the same category as Minnesota, Canada, Wisconsin, Michigan, and so forth. But how do you address that that comment? Is Lake Decatur polluted? Well, I, I can honestly say it is not polluted. Um, at times, it, it is definitely cloudier than any of us would like that, and that's simply because we have almost half a million acres of corn and soybean fields that flow into Lake Decatur. So we have to deal with that cloudiness or turbidity, is the technical term that we use here. That, that occurs during the spring rain off of the spring runoff of the spring rains will, will push dirt into our lake. We can't really do anything about sure. that. Well, we can, but not to the extent we probably want to. You know, when people think of of all lakes being as clear as a as a as a as a glacier lake in uh, Glacier National Park, and we all know that that's not the same not the same geography. We're never going to have that kind of water quality here. Sure. Um, but we've been very fortunate because our, our, our past city councils and the current city council members have supported dredging uh, since, the, since the 1990s. And we've been able to dredge literally the entire lake since the 1990s. We put in three sediment traps or, or sediment trenches in the upstream tributaries of the lake. So we have a deep sediment trench uh, upstream, of, uh, upstream of Ray's Bridge Road. We have one around Grove Road in the Sand Creek area. And we have another one in Big Creek, just uh, west of Baltimore Road. So we have these very large holes 
in the in the bottom of the lake where, where sediment that's coming in into the lake still, even though we've done a good job reducing that amount, it's falling into those sediment traps. Uh, the other reason why you're seeing better water clarity, and we're seeing that too in our scientific measurements as well since we've done this last dredging project, is we had areas of the lake that were so shallow that even the wind induced waves and boating induced waves would stir up the sediment, like Sand Creek and Big Creek in particular. They were so shallow before we dredged that those sediments that were in the bottom of the lake would literally be stirred up, and so the, the water would be cloudier. Well, we've dredged six feet of material out of Sand Creek and five feet of material out of Big Creek, so we no longer have that kind of challenge to deal with. And, and we would agree, we've had numerous comments since we finished dredging that not only is the water quality better, the clarity is better, we've had tremendous uh, uh, sport fishing opportunities since we finished. Now, even halfway through the dredging project, we started getting comments on the fishing was, was improved, and we're still hearing that today. And we have dramatically increased fishing opportunities as well. How much uh, capacity did you gain with the dredging project? Well, the last dredging project, which was basins one through four, that we wrapped up about two years ago, we increased the lake storage capacity by 30%. Now, the lake lost about 35% of its original storage capacity over its 99 years worth of life. We reclaimed all but 5% of that in the last dredging project. That's the equivalent of 60 Willis Towers worth of storage volume. So the Willis Tower complex in Duluth, Chicago, we literally dug out 60 Willis Towers worth of material out of the bottom of the lake. Is that also... Um uh, I'm trying to think what I was going to ask you. The, um, the capacity, you got at least two more months of benefit from it then in a severe drought situation. Is that exactly. reasonable? That was, that that was a good, that's a good ballpark for yeah. us. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, very curious about the uh, dredging, uh, the repository that's out by Ray's Bridge, uh, east of Ray's Bridge, where the sediment went. And that's, I understand that's over 500 acres. Tell us a little bit about it, whether it has potential uh, for soil, uh, what do you do with that, how long will it take to dry down, things like that. Okay, so we bought that property, it was farm ground, we bought that in uh, the mid, I'm sorry, the early 1990s when we started dredging Basin 5 of the lake. And we have a storage site or sediment storage pond that is just under 400 acres in size on that 500 some odd acre site. Uh, so we put dredge material in there in the mid 1990s for the basin uh, five project. And then between about 2004 and 2011, we dredged basin six and we put more material in it. And then we put literally 6,880 acre feet of material into it in this last dredging project which is like 11.7 million cubic acres of dirt. So we filled this thing up. So it's 390 acres, and it is full of sediment from three dredging projects. Uh, the, the material that comes out of the lake is some of the finest particles of the world's best topsoil. It is, it is um, silty, sandy, clay kind of a material. So it's not, it's, it's dark like topsoil because it has a lot of organic nutrients in it. But it doesn't have the structure that, that topsoil has. It's the finer particles. Okay. So it makes it for interesting stuff to reclaim. Um, so we have a sediment storage site out there that we haven't pumped any new material into in it'll be two years in December. And we're, we're slowly drying this thing out. And it's not easy to do because we literally have 25, 30 feet of this material sitting in this, this pond, basically. Um, so we've tried a little bit of farming on a small amount of that, uh, that sediment. And unfortunately, there's, it's still very moist out there, and we have common reed called Phragmites, in particular, overtakes the vegetation. We literally had a stand of uh, rye grass out there, and it literally got over, overrun by Phragmites, common, common reed. We also have a lot of cattails out there, willows, some cottonwoods, and a bunch of other uh, weeds that I, I simply don't know. I mean, opportunistic weeds. Opportunistic plants, that's for sure. So what we're doing is we're looking at ways to uh, 
to incentivize that site? In other words, are there ways that the city can make money on that site besides just selling it? And so we've tried to do some farming on it. It's still too wet and there's too much, there's too much plant competition or weed competition. Uh, we did try a controlled burn earlier this year to try and knock down the vegetation. That only works temporarily. Uh, we've looked at other options uh, and they would involve um, how do we dry that site out so we can do more farming out there. So what we're thinking is, after talking to some firms that also have managed these similar sites in other parts of the country, is we need to do a lot of surface drainage. That means a lot of ditch work, which means a lot of money. And so one strategy is to uh, somehow get rid of the vegetation enough that we can survey the top of the uh, land out there because you need elevations to determine your ditch, your ditch system. So that's one option that we're looking at. Another option we're looking at is literally just let the land stay fallow and not do anything to it. The challenge with that is, is it still doesn't dry out the site. It just allows more plant growth. Eventually, we have to dry it out because the berms that surround the site are still technically a dam, according to the Illinois uh, Department of Natural Resources. That's still a permitted dam structure, and we still get that inspected annually by a professional engineering firm for, for, for um, integrity purposes. But eventually, the state's going to say, you need to dry up the site and decommission those berms, decommission the dam. Okay. So eventually, we're going to have to dry that site, site out one way or the other. Okay. And any final comments on uh, future uh, needs and hopes for uh, clean water and Lake Decatur? Uh, well, a couple things I, I, that would be interesting to mention that kind of go under the radar. Um, we, we had a commercial fisherman on the lake uh, through the Illinois Department of Natural Resources last year, and they harvested uh, hundreds of tons of, um, of, um, of, of buffalo. Yes, thank you. Um, and that's been very successful, and the, the state was uh, was able or is, is advertising to secure another commercial fisherman to do that in this coming year. So if luck, we'll find another uh, reliable commercial fisherman to come in here and get rid of those rough fish that get in the way of our sport fishing. Um, and that's a no charge to the city, and there is a small mon uh, monetary value for that in the, uh, in the in the pet food industry in particular. So. So that, that's something interesting that we, we hope will continue. Um, in terms of water quality and the lake, though, over the long term, the most exciting thing is our Lake Decatur watershed management planning effort that we started about a year and a half ago. The City Council authorized the hiring of North Water Consulting out of Springfield, Illinois. That's done many, many uh, watershed management uh, plans for other watersheds in central Illinois in particular, which are very applicable to ours. They've learned a lot from that. Bottom line is that we are uh, we are actively um, uh, applying for federal and state grants now on an annual basis to get cash to do water quality improvements, not only near the lake and on the lake shoreline, but also in the upstream areas adjacent to the lake. Uh, we think there's going to be an announcement later this year about a successful grant opportunity from the state of Illinois. Uh, we have another huge round of federal grant applications that we're going to be doing later this year that would be announced next year about this time. Um, and um, we are basically supercharging or upsizing the watershed management efforts that we've been doing for decades around uh, the watershed. We're, we're simply doing quite a bit more with quite a bit more money. And the reason why is we want to protect that $92 million dredging investment. We also want to keep nitrates from entering the lake so we don't have to treat nitrates uh, here at the water plant because that cost that cost quite a bit of money to treat for nitrate removal. We don't have to do it very often, but when we have to do it, it's expensive and we'd like to drive that cost down. Because ultimately, everything that we've talked about is paid for by our water customers. So everything that we can do to, to make sure we have an adequate water supply that is also clean, clean and enjoyable to use as a recreational resource, Everything that we can do to do that benefits our, our customers, and we know that. And we want to keep rates as low as we possibly can, but still deliver them the quality of product that they deserve and that they demand from us. I'd like to thank you very much for answering all these important questions. Steve, it's been my pleasure. Thank you for, You're thank you for visiting with all us right. today. I'm with okay. uh, Keith. Okay, I, I want to jump past the history of the Lake Patrol, and uh, I want to say that uh, Jess Snoke was the uh, 
uh, head of the Lake Patrol for 14 years from 1960 until 1974. And we've got the good fortune to have Randy Wax and some of the other people who worked for the Lake Patrol during those years. Randy, are you with us? I am uh, physically present. Yeah. So, Randy, why don't you share with us some of your memories of, of working with the Lake Patrol? Tell us what years that you were with the lake. Well, I started in 1964 uh, while I was in college and uh, got to work uh, eight summers uh, into when I was uh, teaching as well. Uh, in 19, prior to 1964, the Lake Patrol was uh, operated by Jess Snook, a police officer, and all the Lake Patrolmen were police officers. In 1964, they went to college students to be a Lake Patrolman, still operated by the police department. It was a wonderful opportunity for me, along with a lot of other college students, to get to drive a patrol boat, wear our Speedo swimming suits, soak up the sunshine, uh, and patrol the lake and keep it safe. That was really our uh, number one priority to keep the lake safe, not to write tickets or kick anybody off the lake, but just to keep everybody as safe as possible. It was a fantastic job. And if I could have made as much money doing that as being a lawyer, I'd, I'd have stayed a lake patrolman. Actually, the lake patrol won some awards. Isn't that right? During the time you were on the lake patrol? We did. We uh, uh, were up against typically uh, Chicago for the safest watershed uh, in the state, uh, Chicago having Lake Michigan. And we won it several years in a row uh, for having the safest lake in the state. That was quite a feather in, in the city's cap. And you actually received a presidential award as well. Isn't that right? Uh, the president didn't come by, but yes, we did. Yeah. Are there some other Lake Patrolmen uh, uh, who are with us tonight, Randy? Uh, we have uh, Jeff Rupp online. We have Jim McElroy online. I think we might have Dean Chapel online. I'm not sure who else uh, is present. Is Jim McElroy, uh, is, is he with us? He is if he'll unclick his... <laughs> I'm here, but it sounds like I'm causing quite a bit of audio problems, so I'm clicking off. Okay. All right. Is there any of the other Lake Patrolmen who are online that would like to share any of their memories with us? Jeff Rupp? I don't think Jeff has uh, audio access. No. No. I think Carl's with us. Carl Curry. Carl Curry. Carl Curry? Yeah, I'm here, but uh, my audio wasn't working too well earlier. How does it sound now? You sound great. Okay. <laughs> All things considered. Um, yeah, it, it was uh, uh, a good summer job. I got my introduction uh, um, lining the shores of Lake Decatur with big stones for a year or two before I graduated to the Lake Patrol. Um, anyway, um, there are some good memories. Um, uh, but I had to finally decide to do something a little more profitable too. <laughs> Guys, I, I read that uh, back in the late 60s and 70s that there was as many as 3,000 boats that were licensed on Lake Decatur and that there were some weekend days where there was as many as 800 boats on the lake at a single time. Do you guys remember the lake being that busy? Boy, I, I don't remember it being that busy, but it's not as though we were out there counting. Uh, it was, um, I don't know, there was enough to be interesting, but uh, I, don't, I don't remember being swamped at all by the traffic. Yeah, Gary, I, I uh, can remember on uh, 4th of July weekend days and, and also the nights when they're shooting off the fireworks that, that it would be in Basin 2, wall-to-wall, uh, -wall, boats and in the other basins it was just absolutely crazy chaos because there was water skiers and and just boaters uh, to the point where it might have even been a little dangerous 
uh, Randy, and when I look at some of the pictures of the Lake Patrol more recently, I noticed that they're wearing uh, uniform shirts, kind of look like police officer shirts. I assume back in your day, you guys probably weren't wearing onesies like that guy, but uh, were, were you guys even wearing shirts? We had, <laughs> we started out wearing Speedos and that was it. Yeah. And then we got matching uh, tennis shoes and uh, t-shirts. And there's one of the t-shirts, uh, me at uh, the Maffet Street uh, Bridge. And uh, then later on, they went to actually uniform uh, shirts. Uh, each each uh, period of time, they got a little bit more conservative on what we could wear. There's a picture of uh, Jess Snoke along with Steve Watts and me scratching my head and uh, we're just wearing our Speedos right there. That was our Randy, uniform. Were, were you guys in constant communication with the Decatur Police Department? Were you guys working with the police department? We were. We had uh, uh, radios in each boat and we were in community. We were uh, assigned a number uh, and we would call in if we had a, an issue to Central uh, for the police department. If we had a, a serious problem, let's say a boat theft, and the guy was running on the land, we could call uh, Central and they'd have a squad car intercept the individual, which actually happened several times. If there was an emergency, a boat accident or a drowning, uh, we could call Central and they would dispatch the proper emergency vehicles, fire department, ambulances, and that happened many times as well. Randy, do you have any remarks in closing to share with us about your experiences with the Lake Patrol? Well, there's there's so many stories it would take probably uh, half a dozen of these hour-long programs to to fill you in detail. But it was uh, it was an absolutely wonderful job for uh, college kids, uh, and uh, it was an opportunity to to help the community as well. We were all trained in senior lifesaving, first aid, and many of us had Red Cross water safety instruction. Uh, so uh, safety was paramount in uh, what we were doing. Uh, we didn't do it for the money. We started out at $1.60 an hour, I believe. So it wasn't a lot of money. Now, was, that, was that overtime or was that just straight pay? <laughs> <laughs> that was straight pay. We didn't get any overtime. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you in closing, Randy, to talk about the Chris Craft boats. I remember your family had one. Uh, do you remember very many of the Chris Craft boats on the lake? I do. There were there were a number of them. They were all just very, very beautiful mahogany water uh, uh, wooden boats inboard. Uh, fairly expensive uh, comparatively to the, the aluminum <laughs> boats back then and some wooden, not very many uh, fiberglass back then. Uh, there was a Nelson Park Marina back then, which was near what became Swartz on the Lake and then had a number of other jobs uh, names, but a beautiful inboard boat dock where the inboards would store, uh, the owners would store their inboard boats. Um, there was a gas dock there. There was a place where you could get food and uh, probably the best thing for non-boat owners, citizens could go out there and either take a ride on a, on a boat, uh, pay a little bit to go for a ride, or you could even rent boats uh, and go out and drive them yourself. So that, that was really a nice touch back then. And, uh, you know, that's, that's part of our history. Well, thanks very much, Randy. Uh, Steve, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, I really don't. Uh, I think, uh, a good program. I hope everybody has had the same interest in the development of the lake and everything that's gone on. I know there's so much more we could say and talk about. I had uh, a few more pages of things to say, but uh, it's getting late. People are getting tired. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Becky. Good night. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Becky.